What's up guys and welcome back to another episode of Headphones Neil Reviews. I'm your host as always, Headphones Neil, bringing you a packed episode of reviews with a slightly modified app review, but not it's not really an app review this time, it's more of a hardware review in conjunction with an Android app. So with that being said, let's jump right into it. Um, it's going to be a couple of movie reviews, some TV show reviews, and then a follow-up update to a video game that I was able to finish playing because of the hardware um, update that I mentioned earlier. So with that being said, I had a chance to watch John Wick 4 this past weekend. Went out with opening weekend to check it out um, just to see how it is. Does it hold up to the prior John Wick films? We are hoping that it didn't fall into the Matrix, the Matrix Resurrections um, problem where they were continuing on the hype and it fell apart. Um, and to that end, John Wick 4 definitely holds up to the standards of the prior films. So if you've watched them recently, watch them as they came out, then the quality of the film holds up as the conclusion to this set of films. So. With that being said, um, there will be a spoiler for one particular thing, but it is the big end spoiler to the film. Um, there's not really much else to say for the rest of the film, because if you've seen the first three films, then you kind of know exactly what's going on. You're not going to have too much new stuff or anything different or anything out of the ordinary from those other three films. You kind of get a, conti a continuation of the plot, but that's really about it. So one of the first things that you'll notice is throughout the film you kind of have a mix of Westworld and Deadwood because the sets felt a lot like you were in Westworld, especially some of the underground level stuff for the back end of the corporate side of Westworld where you're looking at some of the decommissioned um, androids or droids or whatever, uh, the robots um, and all of that. So you get a kind of look and feel there and then with um, swear engine in this film as well as the man hotel manager um, and then the um, there was one of the guys that um, in the film in this film where he looks really familiar as if he's um, like the sheriff or some part of Deadwood but it as it turns out if you remember the movie Shawshank Redemption um, then the main prison guard was the guy called Harbinger in this in John Wick where he um, oversees the duel between John and the Frenchman and then um, he's throughout the film kind of speaking on behalf of the high table so um, he fit in really well to the point where I'm kind of curious to see if he did ever show up in Deadwood or any other western because he does have a very good um, uh, feel that actually works in this and then the other thing you notice is that John Wick continues to be a film where if anyone asks how can you have the matrix but place in the real world with less um cgi special effects computer stuff tech techiness and all of that and this is a film that you would get because you have john wick fighting against the frenchman who felt like he was very much a uh, parallel to the merovingian um swear engine or I, I want to say Swear Engine is kind of the Morpheus of the film, but because you have uh, Lawrence Fishburne in the film who played Morpheus, you ba you essentially have that connection directly there. But both guys um, fill that role very well, so there is that. Um, the one bummer in the film is, and the one good, not bummer, the, the one good thing about the film is that you actually don't have a dog getting killed, but you have the dog playing a very good role in the film because um the guy that helps john out a lot the guy who's a, basically the tracker um uses his dog to help john out quite a bit so i like that little bit of a connection there where they continued on that theme of um dogs playing an important real or important role in these films um the only downside that i want to say in the film is that i kind of wished that donnie yen and the guy who was um the manager manager of the osaka hotel played bigger roles the manager of the osaka hotel his role i guess was good enough really but i kind of wanted more from him and donnie yen because if you've seen donnie yen in 
Rogue One or his Ip Man films, then you actually get roles that highlight his capabilities a lot more than what we saw in this film. So I actually kind of wanted a lot more. Um, not to say that his acting or his role was bad, but um, the comedic side of Donnie Yen is on point. He always does a really good job there, but I wanted more of his other capabilities to shine in this film. So that's really only the downside, but I am glad that he's in this film. Um, the only other downside that I thought in the film, which actually um, turned into a positive, was early on in the film when, you know, you, these films obviously have a lot of gunplay. So one of the things that you notice right off the bat is, um, and early on in the film, is that I feel like John Wick has unlimited ammo because you never really see him reload. But um, later in the film, you actually do start to see him reloading a lot more. And when uh, Morpheus gives him his gun, they actually explain the uh, capabilities of the gun. And it's like a 12 or 16 round magazine or something like that. So I'm actually glad they got around to explaining that, showing the clip reloading and all that. Because you actually <coughs> it's actually easy to forget that John Wick is reloading throughout the films. I don't remember him reloading in the prior films, but I actually haven't seen those since they came out. So I'm glad that they visually showed us showed him reloading his guns because um, without that, it becomes a annoyance that he, they never explain anything like that. It's like, how does he have so many... Like, the gun holds 12 bullets, but he's um, shot, like, 35 guys. Like, how is he doing any of that? So um, in general, things like that get explained. Um... But the definite highlight of the film, aside from the end sequence with the duel, is the video game sequence in the film. So when John Wick is going through one of the buildings, they actually pan over into an overview of the building with a cutout of the ceiling. Like you see in those, it's kind of like a tower defense game, or like those games where you have your enemies barreling down through hallways and stuff and in a building, you have to set up your towers and turrets and your soldiers and all that. So you kind of get that overview look in the game to, or in the movie, to see John making his way through the building to the point where I actually did not want that sequence to end. And when I rewatch the film, I will definitely be rewatching that film because it was very well done. So I definitely recommend watching the film for that. And it was a very nicely done uh, part of the film. So. When you get to it, you'll know exactly what I'm talking about if you have not seen the film yet. But overall, very well done, very beautifully shot. A lot of um, time and attention and detail was spent in um, putting this movie together to round out these set of four films. So without really spoiling the end sequence, because saying that it's the final film in the sequence se series for John Wick is the spoil basically all the spoiler spoiler you'll need it does look like they're going to be setting up another film with the daughter of the um, osaka hotel um which we'll see if they continue to call it john wick or if they go by her name or something like that or if they fo change the focus of john wick from new york to japan but i am kind of curious to see how they deal with all of that but to that end, when you are watching the film, definitely stay through the end credits because you're not going to get that set up unless you watch that post credit scene. So with that being said, let's turn to um, a lot of Star Wars content. So to start it off, I'm going to start off with The Mandalorian, um, the latest episode, Season 3, Episode 5, which had a lot of stuff going on for a 45-minute episode. So... We have a return of the pirate, um, the guy who looks like Davy Jones, his right-hand man, Vane. Um, we have a continuation of the Mandalorian story arc where they're continuing to find their home. We find Grief Karga in trouble. Um, so he goes to the New Republic. So we get a Tim Meadows connection when um, um, the guy, the father from Kim's Convenience goes to re requisition for support to help them and doesn't get any so he goes to the mandalorians to help them help him out so a lot of interesting politics as far as what's going on with the new republic um and then with the continuing rise of the mandalorians which gave us a very good scene with the father from 
Kim's convenience because we get a connection to Star Wars Rebels. So if you watch that show, then the character Zeb makes an appearance, which for me, when I was watching the show, I was like, that really looks like him, but I wasn't sure. But then I didn't want to assume that it was the same character or like a different character, but from the same species as Zeb. But when you get to the credits of the episode, you do realize that that is him. So we do get a um, Star Wars Rebels connection. Um, but from there, that's really so the basically the po whole setup with the pirates and their defeat and all and all of the stuff that goes on in this episode is essentially to set up the Mandalorians as saviors and give them a new home. So we have um, Mando calling in his favor for or the um, offer from Grief Karga to have a plot of land in Navarro for the Mandalorians to set up a camp where they can live out in the open again. He gives them this big wide open area to set up and uh, rebuild and all that, or give them at least give them a starting point for rebuilding their culture, but also give the armor a reason for the, her to announce that Bo-Katan is going to be going out to reunite the clans and um, essentially send her out on her new quest to um, uh, do basically what we have in Knights of the Old Republic 2 where we are out to reunite the clan so um, because she's lived in both the world where she doesn't have to have her helmet on she's lived on Mandalore ruled and all that and also lived um, with Death Watch in their culture um, it was kind of janky as far as the explanation went but um, it was a good speech and setup as to why um, Bo-Katan is being allowed to go out with her helmet off so um we have her quest going on the mandalorians working on rebuilding their culture and getting more clans so they can retake mandalore which to me feels like it's going to be the um set up to ha have the end season reveal of uh thrawn in this season or in this show so we can set up his appearance in ahsoka so i'm gonna um posit the theory that the Imperial base or all those fighters that we saw on Mandalore was um, actually Thrawn's, Thrawn's fleet and his base of operations or at the very least um, he had he kept a um, um, garrison of troopers there just to protect the pal uh, planet because those were the last orders from the Emperor or that's where he wants to keep his base or anything like that but um, essentially, I think they're going to use the retaking of Mandalore by the Mandalorians to um, introduce Thrawn and provide an explanation um, for events like in the sequels where we don't see very many Mandalorians, so potentially Thrawn took them out, wiped them all out because they were overwhelmed by Thrawn's forces, his strategy, and all of that stuff. Um, so with that being said, um, we're going to jump into Star the season fin 2 finale for Star Wars The Bad Batch, which um, overall it feels like they didn't do too much in this season, but for a season 2 it actually feels like they're setting up more on um, the connection to the sequel trilogy where um, Emperor Palpatine's focus on cloning uh, was a really important piece of what he was trying to do, uh, which they concluded very well in the final two episodes of the Bad Batch, because we in the in episode fifteen for the summit we learn from the doctor, the head doctor guy, that he's working on a special cloning project that's very near and dear to the Emperor, which um, uh, held a very close to the heart or uh, was close to his heart because it's that special project. It felt like a subtle dig to to that, but then with episode 16, Plan 99, even though we have the potential loss of tech, so even though we have the Doctor guy recovering his glasses, we don't actually see what happened to tech's body. So for me, it's um, I follow that theory, which I don't remember where I heard it, that if we don't see it happen on screen, then it didn't happen. So... Because we did not see Tech actually die, that means he's not actually dead. So I have a feeling that we're going to see that he was recovered by the doctor. He's in the cloning facility and being tested on for his technical abilities. And because the doctor wants as many clones as he can get to figure out how to clone the Emperor like how the Emperor wants, 
um, it's basically uh, waste not, want not, um, or want not, waste not, but uh, that's neither here nor there, but essentially we're gonna, it's gonna be an entire setup of um, just that where, um, that's kind of where we're gonna set up, be set up for season three because we have the Bad Batch wanting to recover Omega that they're gonna learn more about the cloning facility or all the cloning facilities and everything that the Emperor's up to. But on the flip side, I think the reason why they introduced us in the summit to Commander Krennic and not um, Director Krennic and the Star Wars or the Death Star Stardust plan is because that's going to play a, a important role in the next season for the Emperor's plan. Or they're we're going to find out that that's where Omega or they're going to use the Death Star as a means of transport as a secure facility for Omega to the Doctor's lab or something like that. You know, kind of thing where somehow the Bad Batch learns about the Death Star in their escape, they end up getting killed off or whatever. So, um, I think that's all, so kind of, season two essentially is that stepping stone between seasons to establish that all, the entire season and the reason why the Doctor wanted Omega was because he not only has the original clone of, Jing, the original female clone of Jango Fett, which I don't remember her name, but I'm gonna call her Alpha, um, but because you have Alpha, Omega, and then all these clones, the reason why cloning was such an important aspect of the season was because um, the head doctor has that original female clone of Jango, so he's trying to figure that all out for the Emperor's plans of cloning himself. So the next season feels like it's going to be an actual setup for all of that stuff. We're going to learn more about the Emperor's plans and uh, what he's up to um for all of his various designs be it his the cloning for himself and transferring his dark side powers um the death star and all of the various projects that he has going on so with that being said um i'm gonna round out this week's um media tv show film reviews with a quick review of the star wars sequel trilogy as i've uh, kind of alluded to a couple times in this episode so um as far to, as far as part of the current year review of the films um one of the things that bothered me when i was watching the, tr the trilogy this time around was in all the years that han and chewie were friends how come han never used chewie's bowcaster or was chewie that, that protective of what um of his weapons, of his bowcaster, and all of that. So um, I kind of wonder if that was what's going on, or maybe Chewie and Han always felt that the um, bowcaster was too powerful or something, but I, always, I just thought that that was kind of weird. Um, and then the things like, why does is Poe the only one who gets a black X-Wing, and why doesn't the black First Order just shoot down this one um, different looking X-Wing. It's like, if you have all these X-Wings that are red and white, and then you have one that's black, obviously that one is special. Either it's, they're all undergoing a paint job and they only did one so far, or there's something special about this guy, so just take him out, and 90% of your problems are solved. So, um, I just thought, I mean, the, initially when I was watching the film, I thought that was cool. You have Poe being the best resistance pilot, but thinking about it now, I mean, that all still holds true. But um, just part of the First Order's weirdness is why didn't they just shoot him down? Because he's the one black TIE fighter, so, you know, he's or the one different one, so shoot him down, for your problem solved. Um, one of the things that hit me this time around, too, that was kind of funny was R2-D2 having a battery saver mode that lets him be in power saving mode for like years and years but for some reason his sensors are still processing something in the background where he hears that they found the map so it was kind of a weird thing so maybe he kept you know turned everything off except for his ears so i wonder if just if it's one of those things where in the background that someone had kept him plugged in or something as they were moving him around just to make sure he they keep his power but I do like that they continue the theme of C-3PO constantly crapping on R2-D2. So, you know, 
them always getting into an argument about something, getting mad at each other, R2 making fun of him. But C-3PO also talking about R how R2-D2's memory banks are very, very unreliable, which to me didn't seem that unreliable. So when R2 um, restores C-3PO's memory and he, 3PO thinks that they're going on the first mission with Rey, I was thinking that's, that's probably the most real world um, backup that we have just because or situ like peril that we have because if you haven't backed up your you know your data for three weeks and then your system crashes and you have to restore it and that's the one you have obviously you're gonna miss you know three weeks worth of data so I just thought that that was a particularly accurate way of looking at it um, one of the downfall or the down parts of the trilogy that I like didn't like of uh, along with most people as well on a other another note is that I kind of really wanted Finn to be a Jedi so we have kind of that whole thing set up in The Force Awakens where he's you know fighting with a lightsaber he's able to do so and you get the real um, inkling that he is and then when you learn that uh, Rey is actually the one with the Force powers goes off to uh, train with Luke I was actually kind of hoping that the whole thing about transferring your life energy to other people and all of that would actually have been a setup for because her and Finn have this particular connection that she awakens the force within Finn and as she's training with Leia and Luke that she's also training with him and because he is more on the side of Poe as far as doing stuff going into battle and all that that's why his training is actually at a minimum so I kind of actually wanted all of that, which also to me goes back to the theory I had years ago that by switching up directors in between films as far as between Force Awakens, Last Jedi, and The Rise of Skywalker, that actually messed up the plans of everything, which is why it feels uneven and why you have a lot more going on in the first and third films versus the middle film. Um, so don't get me wrong that I don't think the middle that The Last Jedi was a bad film, just... A lot of the information was uneven, a lot of it got compressed into the third film, so um, it becomes one of those things where um, I actually kind of hope that we would, or I would hope that we get a little bit more of that, have that Knights of the Old Republic 2 connection where you can enable the Force in other players, so that's kind of really the only um, downside there. And then the other downside of the film is that I was hoping that Lando was the not necessarily in the master code breaker that they're looking for on Canto Bite, but I was actually hoping that they he was a guy that um, Rose and Finn go look for on Canto Bite. So um, because he knows the code breaker, or he knows what to do. They go looking for him. He shows up there. He's actually doing all right um, as a gambler, and that would actually fit in character for him. So it just felt like a. Uh, uh, untapped potential that they could have had him set up there and then um when they find him on that other planet in the rise of skywalker it's because he um of all the events that happened in canto Biden now he's back under the radar of the uh, first order that he has to go into hiding so that to me feels like it could have been a better setup even though it's you know five or ten minutes of screen time to set up um, the character of DJ, um, that would have been a better setup for me to introduce Lando earlier in the uh, trilogy of films, being as how he is that important of a character in the original trilogy. And then finally, um, as far as the running theme on this episode of Palpatine being a clone or all his interest in cloning, I got to thinking that um, Palpatine potentially had died um, years ago and all the um, iterations that we see throughout all the films, whether it's the prequels, original trilogy, or sequels, they are all clones. So when he's Senator Palpatine, he's uh, the Senator clone. When he becomes Darth Sidious and reveals himself, he could potentially have been the same senator and you know because he doesn't have as much force um, protection that's how he was able to succumb to mace windu in the original trilogy he's um the actual dark city is cloned because the original senator's body had died off but this is the original trilogy is the master 
strategist um, Palpatine, so that's why we have that. But because his body is failing at the end, that's how the Rebellions are able to win. And then the one that we see in the sequels is um, the one that actually progressed the furthest because they focused only on Force powers and the dark side and all of that. So um, that's basically dark side Palpatine, but with nothing else. Um, or kind of like the family one who's focused on Rey and all that, but um, one of those things where all of these various ones that are jumping around the galaxy are clones and they're set to reveal themselves at uh, particular times in the galaxy's um, course of events and that's something that the original Palpatine set up because he realized that cloning is the way to go, um, something happened with him and his former master or something like that so one of those things that I'm hoping is that they do with the Bad Batch is that they explain all of that stuff away and they give us more backstory into what what Palpatine's interest in cloning was and what actually became of all uh, became of all of that interest. So with that being said, I'm going to round out this episode with an up update on my gameplay for GoldenEye 007. So as of my last review, I had not quite finished the game. Um, I still had three levels to go. Um, I think it was Control, um, the level after Control, and then the satellite level. Um, and I think I might have, and I think it was Caverns that's after Control. But essentially, I was having trouble finishing Control because I was having trouble getting through all the bad guys that were coming in. There was, I was continuously missing them, and then if you miss one or two, then it becomes overwhelming. It's hard to beat. And as it turns out. Um, Part of the reason, I mean, gameplay is for me, I not necessarily have bad vision, but my aim in video games is always a little bit off. But in playing the game, I realized that the right joystick on my Razer Kishi was just really, really sluggish. So no matter how hard I was, you know, toggling it, adjusting settings and all of that, I could just not move the gun fast enough to keep up with all the enemies. So I got to thinking that because I've been using it for, you know, the past like three years and almost every week pretty regularly you know anywhere from you know 20 minutes to two hours at a time it's probably old it's gotten worn down so i'm gonna get the razor kishi v2 and see how that holds up as far as um a controller goes and um if it's any good is it better than the original and if i can help finish playing golden i uh, using it so the short answer is i did get it and i was able to finish playing golden i was able to um beat control in like 15 or 20 minutes so the prior like two hour or two or three hours that i had spent on it um was not necessarily a waste of time but because i knew what was coming i was able to get through it easily but um the control the controls on the kishi v2 partly because it's the second iteration but also probably because it's new are very very responsive i was able to get through all the enemies beat the level really easily or easily for me and um move on to caverns which was a little bit harder it was a little bit weirder but i was able to get through that as well um same thing with um the final level which for me cavern felt like a level invert of um the dam level basically level one and then the uh, actually caverns and um saddle or the final level feel like they were um level invert of the dam level so as far as um intricacies of them they were all along the same part there was not too much going on visually or for a gameplay but they were pivotal um parts of the game because you have to shut down the computer to turn off the golden eye satellite and then you have to take out alex trevelyan so overall the game ended about as expected i think i still think it's a very good game it has a very good story that really matches what you see in the movie to into a video game format they take out all the extra side stuff and then because of the lower graphics like that's how it looks like they were able to fit in as much of the movie as possible so very good game and if they ever do remake the game i do hope they focus I mean, if they keep everything the same and only improve the graphics, then that would probably be the um, best thing to do with the game just because, to me, nothing else really needs to be changed. I mean, maybe improve the AI a little bit because, you know, the bad guys, will, for some reason, randomly, they'll either just stand around a lot 
or you'll have them, you know, the scientists running around in circles for no reason. They can't get through doors. You'll have the bad guys doing a weird side hop for some reason. So just weird things like that. So fix, if you know, do kind of bug fixes for things like that. But beyond that, nothing much really needs to be changed. Just update the graphics and you're good to go. And people would still have fun playing the game. I know there was a remastered version, I think, made for like the DS or the Wii or something like that and then there was talks about remaking the game already but I don't think anything actually came of that so um, that's kind of why I say I hope they do remake if they do remake the game they just need to update the graphics and you're good to go and um, people will have fun playing the game but uh, for me I'm glad I was able to get through the game with the Kishi V2 it just seems like the my main problem was that right control stick so since I was able to aim and have finer control, more controls, more responsive controls, and all of that, I was able to beat the game because I was able to um, move around and aim a lot more easily and with less sluggishness to um, get rid of the enemies in a more efficient manner. Um, but with that being said, the, as far as the Razer Kishi V2, the main thing that you'll notice when you're using it over the first version is the buttons seem a little bit more clicky but it is more ergonomic so they actually did reduce the profile quite a bit so it's easier to hold so it does feel smaller compared to the first version but um it does seem to work well the buttons are still are like i said are much more responsive so um and a little bit more on the extra sensitive side so when you're you know enabling or disabling the toggles or firing it is a little bit more extra responsive so you have to get used to things like that but overall i do recommend it it feels like a good improvement over the first version so um if you don't have one yet or are thinking about getting one then i do recommend the razor kishi v2 just because it's a name branded um controller that you know if you've heard of razor then you know what to expect there's a few other ones that are known as well but um in reading about it it all depends on your personal preference or what you want to go with some are rated better than others, some are more preferred than others, so I'm not saying the v Razer Kishi V2 is probably the best controller, but for me I can recommend it because you kind of know what you're getting into and it's backed by a company that you can relatively expect is probably not going to go anywhere. So with that being said, that is all for this particular episode of Headphones Neil Reviews. So um, as far as upcoming content goes, um, I actually rece recently received a uh, recommended article regarding the final season of Fear the Walking Dead, I think season 8, and I realized that I have not actually caught up on season 7. So before I watched The Last of Us, I just figured I would start watching Fear the Walking Dead season 7 to catch up on what's going on there, um, me being a completionist, and actually kind of enjoying the show to begin with. I decided that I'm going to watch season seven to see what I missed. Um, I just kind of fell behind on the show just because of the way AMC Plus is, the way they release episodes on, you know, like Google TV and Apple versus their streaming service. So I was like, I'll just watch it when all the season episodes are out and see how it is. But um, overall, so look out for that re review coming soon. As far as a video game review, the next um, game planned is the single player mode for Star Wars Battlefront 2. Um, I did try playing that, I want to say, around December of 2022 when I was first trying out Xbox Game Pass, so I've been thinking that I'll get back into that as the next game, so look out for those gameplay videos coming soon as well. Um, if I'm able to get past where I was when I did that first initial review of the Xbox Game Pass and the game as well, then I'll keep going and seeing how it is. Um, reading some of the overview for the story online, it actually does look very, very intriguing. So I do want to see all of that stuff in action and uh, make that my next gameplay video. So that's all I got for you for this particular episode. If you want to get in touch with me, comment on, um, like provide any feedback or comments or stuff to recommend or anything like that via social media, all the social media links can be found on the website at headphonesneal.reviews along with subscription links, um, how to support the show, and all of that good stuff. Again, that's headphonesneal.reviews at headphonesneal.reviews. But thanks for tuning into this particular episode, and until next time.